as you said, the uh, title is Clean Hands. And of course, the extension of that is And a Pure Heart. Where are you? Where art thou? This is what God called to Adam in the Garden of Eden. What was Adam's response? Did he lie? Did he obfuscate the truth? Did he try to change the subject? No. He told God what was on his heart. I was afraid. He had fear. Why? Why was he afraid? Because he was naked. You say, so what? He had been naked since his creation. And it didn't bother him before this. As it says in the previous chapter of Genesis, in the 25th verse, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Why then the difference? Because they had sinned. And what did God do? He pronounced the sentence upon Satan and upon Adam and Eve. And then he made clothes for them from animal skins. An animal had to die. Blood had to be shed. And clothes became important from that day onward. And still are. You notice that we're all clothed today. Isaiah 61.10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. Where am I going with this? The knowledge of sin that we have. The knowledge of our specific sin. Not just the general sin of mankind, but specifically our personal sin. That is why I rhetorically asked, where are you? Looking at a couple of scriptures and psalms. I wanted to base this talk on Psalm 24, which I'll read. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands, and a pure heart, who had not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessings from the Lord, and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. The word clean is mentioned Many times throughout the scriptures, 194, or about three times in every book of the Bible. Psalm 1820, the Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands, hath he recompensed me. We have two thoughts that go hand in hand, so to speak. Clean hands and a pure or clean heart. Each thought has a direct bearing on the development of the other, as we shall see. Create in me a clean heart, O God, Psalm 51.10. 
Scripture is given after King David was confronted by the prophet Nathan about his sins, serious sins. And David condemned himself by his own word. Nathan simply said, thou art the man. King David of Israel was guilty of compound sins. The first was his adultery with Bathsheba. And then the murder of Uriah the Hittite to cover up his adultery. But King David did not lie about it or try to explain it or rationalize his sins or wheel away from the truth. What he did was to say, Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. As has been said, we can and do have joy when we are at peace with God. As with many people, King David was seduced by letting his sense of spirituality, his commitment to what he knew to be right, to drift away from his true heart intentions of keeping close to the Lord and his word and the Lord's commandments. As it says in 2 Samuel 12, 10, that in doing this, King David despised the Lord. Not in a clear-headed, conscious way, but rather that David let his selfish desires, his lust for a woman, to draw him into a deed he should have known better than to act upon. All through our life, thoughts will enter our mind. Some good, some bad, some truly evil. That's what we choose to continue to have in our mind and to act upon that is important to our character. We might, in the spur of the moment, desire to give someone a dope slap on the back of the head. And this thought would be very satisfying to our human nature. But our boss might not like being struck like that. It would not be to God's glory. Remember, what we do, we're acting for God to bring Him glory, honor, and praise by the way we live. Giving into a selfish motive would be detrimental to our Christian character and to the honor of God whom we are supposed to represent. We are always to remember we are ambassadors for God. This is so well brought out in our June 29th Mena text. One of the Beatitudes, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What is important is not how well we do in trying to attain the perfection spoken of in Matthew 5, 48. Be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. But rather, what was the intention? What was the intention of our heart in trying to do perfectly? Another issue to look at is that we can all see it is easier to live a wholly consecrated life in a state of poverty and humility than it is when we are surrounded by wealth and its pleasures and having all of our temporal needs and most of our wants met. And if you think you are not wealthy, well, you haven't looked out in the third world. 
in so many countries and places today in this world. Simple food, decent clothes, and a safe place to sleep are just not there. And that impoverishes people. This all leads us to the idea of how do we get to where we can have a clean heart? How do we develop a pure spirit within us? What are we? But men. And men are sentient beings. Sentient means the mind. Are our thoughts pure? 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Our thoughts cannot be sinful or will be sinful. Our thoughts cannot be selfish or will be selfish. There is no greater or better feeling than that of giving of ourselves, giving of mercy, as God has been merciful to us. The giving of our love, then it develops love in us, love for our fellow man, as well as love for God, the greatest giver. What was Christ? He had a whole life of giving. Every moment of his life was given to God or in giving of himself to those around him. And conversely, in looking at the antithesis, we have the rich young man going away sadly from possible service with Jesus because he had so much in the way of worldly goods. What do we give? What do we give to others? God. Our morning resolve. My earliest thought I desire shall be. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? What do we give of ourselves, of our time, of our funds, of our love, of our forgiveness to others? Or the question could be asked inversely. What are we not willing to give? Or to part with. Oh, I can't give that. Each of us, deep in our hearts, has some hidden secret that we're not willing to part with, or maybe even to acknowledge that it's something that we harm. With. We know what it is. No one else does, except God. Psalm 44:21. Shall not God search this out? For he knoweth the secrets of the heart. In our thoughts of clean hands. I was watching a uh, video on Marine Corps boot camp. Part of the daily inspection of your per person was the entire group standing erect with our arms held straight out with our hands extended. And the drill sergeant would go down the line of each recruit and inspect their hands for cleanliness. Any deficiency was highly rewarded with extra duty or push-ups or excessive PT. The drill sergeant could always find some infinitesimally small defect in the recruit's bearing or hands and had no trouble thinking of something worthwhile and character or muscle building for that recruit to do. The same thing is true today about the cleanliness of our hands, figuratively speaking, as mentioned in our text. As babes in Christ, we not be sure of the condition of our hands, but as we grow, and the condition of our conscience grows along a proper line, we know we know or we're just fooling ourselves because we can't fool God as he knows our very thoughts. 
The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man, that they are vanity. Today, we are talking about God doing inspection and questioning before entering the kingdom. We should only want to be clean in our hands, in our hearts, in our thoughts, in our worship, in our service to the Lord. Why is it important that our hands be clean? We know that the hand symbolizes power. When God said to Moses in Exodus 4, 2, what is it that in thy hand? It was a rod. It became a serpent. God gave the enemies of Israel into their hand, into their power to do with them as he had previously commanded them to do. What is it within our power to do today? It is what we do with our lives, how we live them. In consecrating ourselves to the Lord, we give our lives to him. He, in turn, gives it back to us. Live your life as you see fit. The question becomes... How are we living out our lives? For us or for him? Selfishly living or living a life of sacrifice? What am I going to do today for God? It might be in giving to others. It might be in my being submissive to the chastening hand of God in my life. To humble me more than what I ever thought I could endure. But God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. If that's what God's will is for me, then I have to accept it with rejoicing. Not stoically, but joyfully. It's what God has given me. Those serve also who only stand and wait. Is this standing less of a service to God than someone who goes out and evangelizes or serves at a convention or a shelter for the homeless or gives out tracts with the message of hope of the kingdom? No. What is important is our heart intention. Whether you serve, or stand and wait, ready to serve. In the 24th Psalm, King David takes a standpoint of the beginning of the millennial age after the time of trouble. When the kingdoms of this world will have become the kingdoms of our Lord, the times of the Gentiles being fulfilled. And Christ will have begun to reign. Then will the words of this prophecy be fulfilled. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. The earth, world, seas, and the floods, the hills, and the mountains are all in this psalm used here in a symbolic and not in a literal sense. The earth and the world represent the present social order that we live in of society today, as has been spoken of in a number of previous talks this weekend. The seas and the floods represent a large part of mankind which persistently frets against the restraints of government and is becoming more and more threatening. That's in the news every day. The hills and mountains represent the different levels of government. When the earth is the Lord's and all of this transpires, it will not be because all the government's kingdoms will have been converted to a pure religion and purified, but it will be because God will have destroyed the nations. 
and brought them forcibly to their knees. God will have founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. <clears throat> the present earth, as it is organized, will be gone. And the new earth will be founded on the ruins of the old. The waves of the restless sea will destroy our present society. So that the wild sea of anarchy shall roll over everything. And then from this wreck and ruin, with desolation and fear and despair, the voice of Jehovah will be heard saying, Psalm 46.10, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And out of a stormy sea, God will bring peace and order through the installation of Christ's kingdom here on earth. When every knee shall bow and every tongue confess to his honor and glory. In the place of this restless sea, there will be a new earth, a new society. Based upon righteousness, he will firmly establish it upon or instead of the floods. There will be a kingdom which cannot be moved. And he will set Christ, his king, upon this holy hill in Zion. And there shall be, as it says in Psalm 72, 7, peace so long as the moon endureth. This is the setting of our scripture. There will be then but one kingdom in all the world, the kingdom of God. Satan's usurpation of God's order will be ended permanently. This hill or kingdom of the Lord is that to which the psalmist speaks of in his question, who shall ascend? into the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? For people to ascend into the hill of the Lord, to go upward on the course, is to come into his kingdom as loyal and obedient servant, as worthy citizens, worthy of all the blessing of eternal life and all its blessing of righteousness, peace, and joy. Who shall be counted worthy? Who? To go to ascend into the mountain of the Lord. And who shall stand in his holy place? The reference here is to the antitype of the typical temple of God, standing on top of Mount Zion, which prefigured the glorious true temple, the true church of the living God, with its kingdom, power, and glory. Who? shall stand in that holy place in the age of glory and blessing. The answer to both inquiries is the same. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. These will be the required qualifications for citizenship in the kingdom. And they are also the qualifications required today if we're consecrated. And there's no difference between our consecration and that of any who have given themselves to the Lord. Requirements are the same. Represented in the clean hands and pure heart, irrespective of whatever class we might happen to fall into due to when we consecrated or how we fulfilled that consecration. The qualifications mentioned here are those of character. The scriptures elsewhere make more specific mention of the necessary faith, but always they are implying a character and life that is consistent with our faith that we profess. Let us consider the character requirements here mentioned. 
Clean hands. That means clean action, clean conduct. It is in our power to live our life as we choose, for good or for evil. If bad habits of any kind have been developed in us, they must be changed. Romans 12, 2. Be ye transformed. I remember Brother August saying, it doesn't do to say, it's just the way I am. Or it's the way I've always been. We must change our ways to be acceptable to the Lord and to have these clean hands. It is delusional to profess loyalty to God and his anointed king and kingdom while our while we continue in a sinful way. In knowingly living a sinful life, we profess our loyalty to Satan and his host of demons and all that they represent. And as it says in six, Romans 6.23, their way ends in death. Our loyalty to the Christ and his kingdom signifies that we are determined to be a continual, continual opposition to sin in whatever its forms. A pure heart is one that possesses a purity of will, intention, purpose. We must always serve righteousness. There's no room in a pure heart for anything else than purity. A pure heart loves righteousness and truth, and conversely, hates iniquity. It loves purity and despises all that is impure and unholy, even as God does. Let's read the Psalm, the Proverbs. A pure heart delights in the company of the pure and shuns all others, knowing that the whole world has been led aside toward the course of evil. 1 John 5, 19. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. In the Psalms, it talks of who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity. Pride is an abomination to the Lord. It's like a weed. If not pulled out, will soon crowd out the fruits of the spirit. Being a master gardener, I was taught that the definition of a weed is anything that grows where you don't want it to grow. And those things always seem to grow the best. In a field of corn, corn is what you want. But in a field of wheat, the occasional corn of stalk is out of place, unwanted, a nuisance. Psalmist says, I hate vain thoughts. Pride goeth before destructions. In Proverbs 6, these six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that deviseth wicked imagination. Feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaks lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. As Brother Jolly noted, it is a fact that those who have enjoyed the light and been shown the light with us and have left it seem afterwards. <clears throat> You have a deficit of decency, reasonableness, honesty. And so I end this discourse with the hope and prayer for all of you and all of our brethren that we may all be faithful and forgiven, that we may all be of this clean hands class, that enter into the kingdom. Praise God from whom all blessings flow, for they all flow toward the kingdom. May the Lord add his blessing.